Hello, everyone, and thank you for attending today's webinar. This is Steve Gorin. Uh, the webinar is Preserving Income Tax Benefits from the State Tax Audit, S Corporation Sales, Partnership Redemptions. Before we begin, we wanted to cover a few housekeeping items. If you have any questions during the webcast, you can submit them through the Q&A widget at the bottom of your screen. We will try to answer these during the webcast, but if a fuller answer is needed or we run out of time, it will be answered later via email. Uh, a copy of today's slide deck is available on the resource widget. We encourage you to download any resources or links that you may find useful. Um, and there should also be a copy of my uh, newsletter from the fourth quarter 2022 there. Um, you can find additional answers to some common technical issues located in the help widget at the bottom of your screen. This webinar is CLE accredited in California and Illinois for one and a half hours of general COE credit and Missouri for 1.8 hours of general COE credit. The webinar is also COE accredited in New York for one and a half hours for uh, experienced and transition credit. One and a half hour of general COE credit in Texas is, is pending. We award COE based on attendance for the entire 90 minutes. Due to changes in jurisdictional requirements, you'll notice that we are no longer using automated pop-up attendance checks. As required, we will display secret words in three multiple choice polls during the webinar. You will be required to select today's secret word from a multiple choice list. Please respond to these three polls to demonstrate your continued engagement and to earn your full COD credit. We value your opinions and appreciate your participation in the course. <clears throat> so now, without any further ado, we'll, we'll get into the topic. Um, so, so first of all, I'm going to talk about preserving income tax benefits from a state tax audit, because uh, the state tax audits can, can uh, cause a state inclusion or increase valuation and give you additional basis. And so we can, we'll talk about, about trying to coordinate that with income tax issues. We're going to talk about S corporation sales, uh, and, and, and that's going to include uh, just trying to have you know, good tax consequences when you're selling your business. Uh, and, and particularly, we're going to talk some about installment sales. And then we're going to talk about partnership redemption, which is going to include, um, first of all, why a partnership redemption is better than a sale of a partnership interest uh, uh, and or at least a pros and cons. And then we're going to talk about uh, just a few minutes about a little about a case where there was a redemption that had very unexpected income tax consequences. Okay, so you've, you've got my slides, and there's newsletter articles which link to the, to the page on the big PDF supporting the article. So, you know, on the newsletter, uh, in, the, in the middle, there's a the yellow box, and you can click on the link in the yellow box and download my big PDF. It's probably best not to go back and forth right now because there's there's a lot to unpack um, but we you, we will be sending out um, a, a link to a recording of the webinar so if there's things you kind of want to go back and forth on you can go back and review it at your leisure um, so then this next slide slide four just mentions uh, when you are reviewing at your leisure if you have the slides open and the big PDF open how you can navigate back and forth between the two of them so you can you can find the support for whatever I'm saying. All right, so let's dive into the first newsletter article about preserving income tax benefits from the state tax audit. And you can see up at the top of the slide, there's a, a little parenthetical, Roman numeral three, point capital B, point five, point G, um, and and so that's what you can that's where you would find in my big PDF that's where you would find the support for us on the slide. So again, we're going to talk about coordinating savings and and income tax statute limitations, and we'll talk about a recent case in which the taxpayer failed to take the steps necessary to preserve rights to income tax benefits and therefore lost them. So of course. Uh, and, and IRS, we call it informally audit, but we call it examination, uh, can increase the taxable estate. And you can 
You can do it by increasing value or by bringing prior transfers back into the state. And, and there's the so-called string provisions of um, and uh, 2035, 2036, 2038, and and then 2042, which is life insurance. Um, so 2035 is the three-year rule that, that basically says if you have inclusion under 2036, 2038, and 2042, you you may have to and 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 you release those powers, you may have to bring that back into your state. Uh, within if you die within three years after doing that. So um, anyway, uh, I do have just really basic stuff on on these string provisions, and and I don't I don't really tend to cover them extremely thoroughly. I pay a little bit more attention to life insurance than than, than some other things. Okay, so when when an audit disregards an entity and and increase, includes the entity's assets in the decedent's gross estate, those assets get directly get a basis step up. So, for example, in the Herford case, H-U-R-F-O-R-D, the, uh, the, the uh, tax court agreed to disregard the existence of a partnership. And, and later on, there were some transactions that went on, and... And the question is, uh, what was the consequence of the inclusion um, of the disregarding the partnership and including the assets in the estate? And the tax court said, um, well, no, no entity there for estate tax purposes. Therefore, there's a there's a basis step up um, of those assets inside the partnership, uh, and you don't have to make any particular types of elections. They get a direct basis step up because they were directly included in the decedent's gross estate. So um, that's, that's quite a benefit. Uh, now, most of us, when we file our state tax returns, aren't going to want to be tax return filing position that we're going to disregard the partnership. <clears throat> so if there is a partnership, um, then you should do um, a code section 754 election, which we're going to get into in a moment. Um, but I also wanted to just point out that I do have some materials here on the on this idea of an inside basis step up and how it applies to different entities. Um, and then I'm going to talk about partnerships in a moment a little bit more. So, um, you know, a lot of people like to say, oh, an S corporation is the same as a partnership because all the annual income gets passed through to the owners on K-1, and you can take those taxable earnings out without any income tax consequence. Uh, so, so they think, oh, they're the same. But it is very far from the truth. So when the owner of stock in an S corporation dies uh, and the S corp stock is included in, in that owner's gross estate, uh, then the S stock get a basis step up um, or down, as the case may be. But there is no change whatsoever to the basis of the S corporation's assets. Um, and actually, I, I do have that more on, the, um, on this next slide. Um, so so that, that's going to be um, the, the problem with an S corporation was with a partnership you can make what's called a code section 754 election. And that election allows you to pass along your basis step up to the partnership's assets. Uh, and and that, that election, um, it, it's actually the election is, is to apply a code section 743 basis adjustment. And, and what happens is that there's a separate tracking of, these, of, of this basis adjustment. So the partnership um, keeps the same old basis on all the assets the way it always had before, and then it creates a separate, uh, like a deemed asset, uh, based on this basis adjustment. And whenever, this has, whenever the, uh, 
the effects of the 754 election are implemented, what you're doing is basically you're reconciling the outside basis, your basis in the partnership interest, with the inside basis, the partnership basis in its assets. So uh, a lot of people kind of think, well, you're passing along the outside basis increase, um, which, which is, you know, it, 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 is, it is a correct bottom line. Um, but what you're really doing is you're doing a catch-up to reconcile the outside basis with the inside basis. Because there may have been changes in the outside basis relative to the inside basis uh, before the 754 election was made. And, and whenever you are having a transfer that will cause the 743 basis adjustment to be made, that's when you do the reconciliation. So it's a cumulative reconciliation. It's not just passing along the basis stuff of the death, but it's all it's, it's reconciling the entire any entire difference between outside basis and inside basis. So it's kind of like a, a potential catch up if there were any kind of differences that occurred before. Um, now, if you have a partnership that has uh, a built-in law that exceeds $250,000, and this is a cumulative built-in law. You compare the fair market value of all of the partnership's assets to the fair market to the basis of all the partnership's assets, and and if the basis, the cumulative basis of all the partnership's assets exceeds the value of all the partnership's assets by more than $250,000, then you have an automatic. Um, inside basis adjustment uh, and uh, like like potentially down. Um, so one of the things to think about is is if you if you do have unrealized losses inside a partnership, yeah, and and particularly if you have marketable securities partnership, this is pretty easy to monitor. Um, then then you're well advised to, to tell the client, hey, take your unrealized losses now, and and get the benefit of those capital losses, and and then um, and then we won't have to have this basis step down on the death. The S corporation deal uh, has to do. I, I'll just run through a very very quick example. So let's suppose you had an S corporation, and, and the decedent owned 100 percent, and we're going to ignore. Uh, uh, discounts for lack of control, lack of marketability, and other types of discounts. So suppose suppose the S corporation has assets worth a million dollars with a zero basis, and 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 then and then you have 100 percent. So when the decedent dies, there's going to get um, a, a basis step up in the stock to a million dollars. When the S corporation um, sells its assets. For a million dollars, there's going to be a million dollar capital gain. Um, and this, by the way, this is all explained in that 2HAA that I have cited there. So, so that million dollar capital gain is going to flow through on a K1 to the estate, and and it's going to be in, reported in the estate's income. Um, now, at the same time, that that million dollar gain is going to add to the basis in the stock. So you have a million dollars from the basis step up and a million dollars from the gain. So you have a $2 million basis in the stock. And, and then, when, then when, you, when you liquidate the corporation, if you, you want to liquidate it in the same year that you sell the property, uh, then you're going to have a million dollars of sale proceeds and a $2 million basis in the stock. So there's a $1 million loss on the liquidation. And that $1 million loss on the liquidation will offset the million-dollar gain um, on the sale of the property. So, so then you kind of have a wash. So that's the idea. There are a lot of ways when this will not work out quite as smoothly as I have pictured it. And I don't have time to go over that today, but I'll just refer you to the materials to, to see what I write about it. All right, so in terms of timing, statute of limitations, 
So example, the season died November 1st, 2022, because, you know, of course, that's what the seasons do is they die. Um, and the estate tax return ordinarily would have been due August 1st, 2023, but it was extended by six months to February 1st, 2024. The statute of limitations for auditing the estate tax return ordinarily would run on February 1st, 2027. The IRS can audit the return before then. Um, on the other hand, the case goes to court and might not conclude until much, much later than February 1st, 2027. So from meanwhile, um, what would happen if you if the, some assets were sold in December of 2022? So, you know, you filed the tax return in 2023, and if you had a three-year statute of limitations, then the statute of limitations for amending that return would be in 2026. Um, but you can see 2026 is going to be a lot earlier than when the, when the case might get resolved, because it might not get resolved until 2027 or later. So... When you have an estate that has assets with an uncertain value um, or you have a question about estate inclusion, things that the IRS loves to attack, uh, then you want to take some steps to preserve your income tax benefit um, if there's an audit. So um, IRS Publication 556 uh, goes through the process for filing a, um, a, a contingent uh, cl a protective claim for refund. Uh, and, uh, and you can see, basically, I just have some bullet points from what IRS Publication 556 says, uh, and I'm not going to go through the mechanics now. I just want to let you know where to go so you can work through what you're going to do. Um, and... You can see there's a couple of different ways. You can file a form 1040X in a minute, and it's sort of minute 1040 to make an income tax claim. But you, you could, but there's also ways you can just actually just file this claim with the IRS, um, and and the IRS will delay action on the protective claim until the contingency is resolved. So, um, so you just you kind of file that protective claim, and then you can kind of set it on the shelf. Um, and and then uh, and then come back to that when you have the estate tax audit being done, um, but but you 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 ought to um, really think about what all things you need to do. So let's suppose you had a partnership that was interested in, included in the gross estate, um, and suppose that partnership had an interest in other partnerships. <clears throat> so. You need to have a code section 754 election at each level in order to be able to implement those adjustments later on. So, so to think about number one, getting the election in place, and number two, making sure that protective claims are filed at the appropriate level to be able to make those adjustments. Now, a lot of people don't realize this, but every decedent's estate, revocable trust, et cetera, is required to notify the partnership of the decedent's death. Um, so those are regulations under the partnership income tax rules um, because, you know, they want, they, a lot of times they do need to know that there's a disparity between, um, you know, what, what you're, what you're, you know, that there's a difference with your outside basis that might have, that might have changed. That can be relevant to the partnerships. Um, and, in fact, now they have these requirements for what they call uh, tax basis capital accounts. Um, you, you, you need to do um, capital accounts under 704B. The 704 parentheses B as in boy um, requires you to basically have a certain type of capital account method, methodology. And, and that tends to be booking things at fair market value when they're contributed to the partnership. Um, and 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 booking any distribution at fair market value when it's when it comes from the partner when it leaves the partnership, um, but uh, so you have to have a capital account that's based on those ideas with those ideas, 
Um, and the fair market value of what you contribute or the fair market value of what you take out may very well differ from the basis. And the IRS is now requiring you to have two sets of books. You can have one set of books that, that has that fair market value accounting um, as well as the accounting for just the normal day-to-day stuff. Um, and and um, and then you also need to have uh, keep track of the tax basis of the capital account. So they, they, they now have to disclose those. On the, on the annual tax return. So uh, so a lot of paperwork for partnerships. They are the most flexible thing, so they are kind of the best thing that you can do um, in terms of having income tax flexibility. You just have to be prepared to deal with the paperwork. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit more about this. Uh, when an amended return can't generate tax fairness, there may be other ways to get relief. Uh, and, and you can see I have a cross represent that first bullet point to 2G4M, and I talked there about the idea of claim of right and equitable uh, um, recruitment. So claim of right would be like, let's suppose, um, suppose your client were Al Capone. Um, so Al Capone is required to report on his income taxes um, all of the protection money he receives from um, from all the businesses he victimized. Oh, I'm sorry, for tax. Um, and and uh, so he is required to report that. Um, but because that's extortion, which is a tort, um, those victims can uh, can get their money back. Uh, potentially, um, if they sue him and and they don't um, have an accident along the way to the court, um, and and so um, so if if Al reports his income from this extortion um, in one year and then ten years later his victim gets the money back, he can't get an amended return uh, to get his to get his taxes to to take um, you know to to get that money back to take into account the fact that he had to pay the money back. So, um, so he may need to um, do what's called the claim of right and say, you know, I had this money, I was, and I and I received it, and I didn't have any restrictions on its use, um, but but uh, but it, but I wind up losing it because it was illegal. So, so I want to get my deduction. So that's the claim of right idea, and it's equitable recoupment uh, when. When taxpayers um, have some income tax uh, detriment that befalls them, uh, and and they, and that detriment should be reversed in all fairness, um, and and can you get that money back on a later return? So that's the idea of equitable recoupment. So so you know taxpayers can you know can beg for mercy in, in these. Two types of cases, but the taxpayer needs to take whatever steps it should have to preserve its rights. And we have a 2022 case here, O'Neill Trust, where the taxpayer uh, did not make sure that all the steps. This is a tiered partnership, and and he didn't take all the steps to make sure that um, he would get all the tax benefits um, if there were an IRS audit. Uh, that that increased the value of the partnership or caused it to be included in his estate uh, because it was disregarded. So so the taxpayer did not take all those steps, and the IRS said, you know, the court basically said, well, don't come begging us for mercy. You had a way to protect yourself, and you did not do it. So um, so taxpayers need to do need to do what they need to do. All right. So here comes your, the first polling question. Uh, today's first secret word is tax. Please select the correct word below. Jacob, is that poll running?
All right. Polls won. We're good to move on. Okay, so now let's start talking about S corporation sales. Um, so I'm going to first very, very briefly go over uh, IRS relief of various mistakes in the S corporation area. And then we're going to talk about installment sales and, and other, and, and as well as just um, the idea of having what happens when you sell a business. Okay, so when you have an S corporation, um, you need to think about the state income tax issues on the sale of business interest with the sale of the business assets. Um, I'm going to talk about about those issues in recent cases, and then I'm going to uh, talk some toward the end of this segment about the deferred sales trust, which every now and then I keep hearing stuff about. Um, so. So first of all, when a prospective buyer does income tax due diligence and the S corporation is being sold, the income tax advisor search for every possible flaw in, an, in the S election. Um, those of you who heard me talk about S corporation before, I, I may, you may have heard this. Um, basically, you know, you've heard stories of you know, alien abductions, uh, which we used to hear a lot more of than we do now. Um, and, and then people will talk about how they have these invasive body probes. Um, and and that, those types of invasive body probes are what they do to the S corporation uh, related to this election. So when you, when you, you may have some, some things that might have busted the S election, um, but the IRS has been directed uh, to provide relief for mistakes um, so that you don't whipsaw the government. Okay. Um, so the all shareholders have to consent to that relief, and they and they also have to agree to make whatever adjustments might be required in, in order to uh, prevent gaming the system. So the idea there would be. Let's suppose you have um, an, an S corporation and 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 a shareholder. Uh, you basically, you want to get the relief, but a shareholder wants to be a jerk and say, "No, it was really a C corp and not an S corp." So, what what would happen is, if the IRS agrees that the S corp is uh, S election is, is is valid, then the S corp is not going to be paying the taxes, and then it goes to look to the to the shareholder who, who has their K-1 and says, shareholder, you know, where's your where's your income on the K-1? And the shareholder will say, hey, I don't agree that with your granting the relief to the to the S corp. I think it's a C corp. So I'm not going to pay any income tax on my on, on my K-1. That was that was an invalid K-1 that you let the corporation foist on me, and I'm not going to pay the income tax. So you can see the IRS would get whipsawed by that. So all shareholders need to consent to that relief in order for the for the IRS to grant that relief, and the shareholder agreement should require consent uh, for the shareholders to basically consent to that relief. So um, there's there's really not often an adequate remedy to to having the S election busted. Like if you if you bust the S election and then you elect it again. Then, first of all, all of your accumulated adjustments account AAA is lost. So AAA is the S corporation's taxable earnings that can then be distributed income tax free. And, and and this is important if the S corporation used to be a C corporation, uh, because a C corporation when it pays its earnings out, those are taxable dividends. So you want to be able to document that the that the distributions came from the S corporation's taxable earnings uh, and, and was not taxable to the shareholder uh, rather than being a dividend from a C corp, which would be taxable to the shareholders. 
way you do that is through this uh, this AAA, the accumulated adjustments account. And when you bust that election, you lose the AAA. Um, and um, and then the other thing is that once a C corporation makes an S election, if it sells its assets within five years of making the S election, then it has to pay tax on all that on all the both in gain that existed at the time of the S election. So let's suppose um, that S Corp has an asset with a million dollar value and a zero basis, um, and if it sold that asset, fine, that all gets post passes through to um, to the owners, and there's no S Corp level tax. Let's suppose the S election is terminated, and the day after it's terminated, um, the C corporation sells that asset. Well, that, the whole million dollars is going to be subject to tax as a C corp, even though that built-in gain arose when when it was an S corp. So that's kind of silly to um, to make to, to to turn that into a C corp. Uh, there would have been <laughs> it would have been smarter to um, to keep the S corp intact and move the business into a C corp subsidiary and, and then, and then lease that property to the business. And, and that way you wouldn't, you wouldn't have that issue when the property gets sold. Um, Cause if the C corp sells, you'd have the million dollar, um, you know, gain on the S corp and you don't get any additional basis in the S corp and the, in the shareholders hands, I'm sorry. And so when the C corp makes a distribution, there would be, there would be a, a, a dividend out to the shareholders, so there'd be double tax on that instead of single tax. So now let's suppose this this um, this uh, C corp has this asset that originally had a zero basis and a million dollar value before it made the before it became a C corp, and then let's suppose um, some uh, five years pass. Now the C corp decides to make an S election, and the property is worth a million and a half dollars. And again, still has a zero basis. So um, if the corporation, with um, after it makes that S election, if that turns around right away and sells that asset for a million and a half dollars, there's going to be a built-in gain um, of a million and a half that is taxed at the C corporation level, and there's going to be a K-1 for that million-and-a-half-dollar gain minus the income taxes that the C-Corp had to pay on that gain. So there's going to be a double tax going on. There's a little coordination there to mitigate it, but, but there's still this double tax going on. And, and that's the case even though the first million dollars of that gain was earned while it was an S-Corporation. Uh, so there's, there's really no good remedy for um, when you bust the S election and you lose your AAA and you have this possible broken gain tax, it's just really expensive to, 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 to do something. So you really need to go and protect that S election. All right, so how do you fix um, various things you blow? Well, on the slide after this, uh, I've got I've got some um, list here of of different uh, items that uh, that that will show you um, what what elections you can you can kind of fix. Um, but there's two revenue procedures. One that came out in 2013 to provide this is an automatic release, um, and and that. Then in 2022, there was another revenue procedure that came out that provided additional relief. The 2013 relief remains 100% in effect. There is no changes that were made whatsoever to that. The 2022 revenue procedure just, just layered additional relief on top of that. And if you can't, um, if you can't get um, that automatic relief, you have to get a private letter ruling, which could take six months. Goodness gracious! I didn't update my filing fee. It went up to like 50 grand in 2022. 
So it's very expensive. And I don't remember what the um, what the initial 2023 rep proc came out with what it said for the filing fee, but but they're they're very expensive. Um, so so like you know, it, it, it's as if you took they 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 spent you know a third of a year working on your private letter rolling didn't do anything else. I'm, I'm not quite sure why it costs so much. Um, but um, at, at any rate, uh, the, the the big problem with the private letter ruling is, uh, of course, the fee can be expensive, but when you're selling a business worth, you know, tens or hundreds of millions of dollars, that's really not material. What's material is that the IRS will tell you that its target is to get the private letter ruling turned around within six months. Well, if you got a strategic buyer coming in and paying double what the price, what the business is worth, and now all of a sudden they have to wait six months to close the transaction, um, that's going to inject a lot of financial risk. And can you imagine being the advisor on that? And 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 there was something wrong with the asset election that you missed, and and then and then boom. Um, the sale falls through, and and the client blames you for the sale falling through because something happened while you're waiting for the PLR. So that's a a um, potentially horrible result. And and I do and I do have <clears throat> I'm going to show you on the next slide what the relief is. But I discussed this relief for a whole hour in a, in, a, in the uh, web in the Linebook webinar I did, um, which. Yeah, you do have to pay something for it if you take it. But um, but anyway, here's here's everything listed on slide 20 of the different types of relief that you can get. Um, so it's a long list of things. The IRS basically decided, look, it, it, it was tired of getting all these letter rulings. A lot of the times they were just comfort rulings to satisfy the buyer's tax advisor and and so they said they said they didn't want to be bothered with them. So, so there's your there's your your, your list of things where you can have relief. All right. So now we're on slide 21, and um, I do list there some tools for deferring or avoiding the gain on the sale of the business. Um, most of them have limited application. Um, this last one, the code section 1202 exclusion, applies only if you have a C corporation. And one of the things I'm here to say is this code section 1202 exclusion, I believe, is way overblown as a tax benefit. Okay, I'm going to uh, get into this some more, a little bit more right now. So. Buyers prefer to get a basis step up in the business's property. And I already mentioned that you normally can't get an inside basis step up. But but there is an election that you can make to treat a sale of S corporation stock or C corporation stock as if it were a liquidation of the business followed by a sale of the stock. Uh, I wouldn't say, well, yeah, I mean, I'm sorry, um, a sale of the asset, sorry, a sale of the asset followed by a liquidation of the business. So um, we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, and, and, and I do have some other things. Uh, uh, the last quarter's webinar, we talked about trying to avoid possible ordinary income on the sale of a partnership or S-Corp. So I refer you back to that webinar, and, of course, it's available for replay if you if you missed it or you want a refresher. When you when you do have this, this being sale of the business's assets, if you have a corporation that's doing the deemed sale, the buyer and the seller are allowed to – decide how to allocate the purchase price. Uh, and, and, and I do have a sample allocation in the materials that, that discusses how you might do that to minimize the ordinary income aspects of that. But another thing to, to point out is that 
<clears throat> when you sell a partnership uh, and and then you're doing inside base to step up those assets, <clears throat> there is a different set of rules that you need to follow when you are allocating the sale price to those assets. So there can be a substantive difference when you have a partnership versus a corporation. So keep that in mind. <clears throat> um, and then you can see I have a section there on partnership basis adjustments, which basically says what those rules are when you do sell the business. Okay, so when you have this, um, I mean, the, and the buyers, I'm sorry, I don't even remember if I said this, but um, the buyers do want to get the inside base and step up on the business property. So if you think about when you sell the S corporation's assets, so in my example that I had before, when you sell the million dollar assets with a zero basis, okay, then you get basis in the stock. <clears throat> so let's just go back to that example. And let's assume that the the shareholder didn't buy at all. The shareholder has just gone along. They have their S corp. They have zero basis in their S corp stock. They've got a million dollars of assets inside the S corp, and they want to do a sale. And the question is, are they going to pay tax on the sale of the stock? because the stock is worth a million dollars and it has a zero basis? The answer is generally no, because the buyer wants to buy the assets. So either the buyer is going to buy the assets from the corporation or there would be this sale of stock and you make this election uh, that will – be a deemed sale of S corporation's assets followed by the liquidation. So, so what if you do the deemed sale of the million dollar asset by the corporation? So the deemed sale will give a million dollar gain to the shareholder, but that's on the sale of the asset. The million dollar gain on the sale of the asset will pass through to give a million dollar basis in the stock. So the sale of the stock did not generate any gain on the sale. The, the stock had a million-dollar basis and a million-dollar sale proceeds. So there was no gain on the sale of the stock. So people say, let's be a C-Corp so we can get our 1202 exclusion. And, and that 1202 exclusion has all sorts of limitations and it's good only for the the basically the original issue stock, um, and 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 there are limitations on it. And once you're beyond those limitations, then you do have to pay tax. Uh, and and not all states recognize 1202 either, so you got to pay state income tax potentially on the whole thing. But when you but when you are going to be selling your 1202 stock, chances are that the buyer is going to want to get a basis step up in the assets that the corporation owns. So you're going to have a deemed sale of the corporation's assets. So either way, whether you sell a uh, 1202 stock or S-Corp stock, there's going to be a gain on the sale of the assets, but not a gain on the sale of the stock. The only difference is there are chances of having – gain on the sale of the 1202 stock. Uh, number one, because there are limitations. Number two, because state income tax. Uh, and number three, what if you somehow blow eligibility for 1202? So, so all of those are problems that exist for 1202 stock that do not exist for S-corporations. On the other hand, when the C-corporation sells its assets, the federal income tax rate on that is 21%. Whereas when the S corporation has a deemed sale of its asset, you have potential for some ordinary income. But even if it's capital gain, um, you'd have you'd have a, a, a 20 percent capital gain rate in the top bracket, and, and you may have a 3.8 percent net investment income tax. 
uh, which is abbreviated NII, or me, for those of you who are Monty Python and the Holy Grail fans. And so, so your, but your S corp sale of the assets might be taxed at a higher rate than the C corp's sale of assets. So that, that's the the one downfall from the S corp. Uh, but there are workarounds to try to uh, avoid having ordinary income tax on it, and and if the shareholder uh, actively works in the business then you avoid the 3.8% net investment income tax and have only a 20% from a federal viewpoint, a 20% tax compared to 21% for the corporation. So um, anyway, S-Corps can be much better than 1202. Now, when you have a partnership, you don't need to have this deemed gain on the sale of the partnership's assets to get a basis step up. When you sell your partnership interest, you have a 754 election in place. The inside basis step up is automatic. And uh, now, now the the one issue is there may be some assets inside a partnership that are what we call hot assets, like like um, if you're a cash basis shareholder, you have accounts receivable, or maybe de- depreciation capture, stuff like that, maybe ordinary income. So you do have issues with that with a partnership. Um, even though you're not selling the assets, there, there may be a component of that. Uh, this is Code Section 751. But, you know, again, it's in this cross reference in my materials earlier when we talked about when you sell a partnership, there may be an ordinary income component to it. Um, so, so at any rate, um, when you sell the partnership interest, uh, for the most part, it's just going to be capital gain without a deemed sale of the underlying asset, but there may be an ordinary income component depending on your mix of assets. Um, but, but it's not, even if, even if you have an ordinary income component of, on the sale of the partnership interest, it is not a deemed sale of the underlying asset. And that can have an impact for state income tax purposes. So if you have a deemed sale of the business asset, uh, then they, those are taxed to the state where they are located. And, um, and, and if you have a partnership sale, then you, you only have a tax where the partner is located because the partnership interest is intangible personal property and its situs is the place where the seller is located. So you can, depending on where everybody is, you can save state income tax by doing a, by selling, by having a partnership that gets sold instead of having an S corp that gets sold with the team sale of the asset. And there was a recent Massachusetts case that held that there's something called the multi-state tax commission where the state departments of revenue kind of get together and they, they try to make sure there's uniformity and fairness. They all want to get their share, uh, their fair share of the, of, of, of your money when you, when you get income or you sell a business, um, you know, what's fair is of course, in everybody's difference in everybody's eyes, but they will kind of coordinate it to avoid having unfair double taxation. And when you do a sale, you, you could actually go to them and try to work things out if you see some kind of double tax, uh, you know, arising. Uh, but the, the multi-state tax commission actually did say generally when you sell a partnership interest, um, you, you don't have to worry about paying tax where the assets are located. It's only where the seller resides. They did actually say that in their, in their model laws. But they are concerned about people who might um, just artificially create a partnership in order to avoid having state income tax on the sale of the asset. And so the Multi-State Tax Commission does have a project going on uh, to look into those issues. And and I very much appreciate uh, Act Tech fellow Gray Edmondson, who 
told me about about this case and and provided a lot of resources and and i've I've integrated uh, you know those resources into my materials and cited an article that he that he did um, so so thank you very much Gray. all right so now I'm going to kind of move on from the from the income taxation of uh, of the sale of the asset and get into if you defer gain using an installment sale. So uh, the installment sale rules uh, basically say that when you sell your like stock, then you can wait to pay the capital gain tax until you actually receive the sale proceeds. So you may get an installment note, and you can elect to defer the gain until you actually get the collections on the note. Uh, so that could be very helpful. Uh, now, if you have the deemed asset sale, there's some additional complexity in order to try to preserve this installment sale treatment, and my materials go into that. Uh, now, if you redeem a partnership interest, that tends to help the seller even more than installment sale, and that's going to be discussed in the last segment. All right. Now, if you are definitely going to sell the business interest in a few years and want to defer capital gain on the sale, you can sell the business interest in an installment sale to a non grantor trust. And then just don't get principal payments and uh, and then and then you just wait for that until the business is sold. Um, and the trust will receive the basis for the full amount of the note. So it can sell the business in, uh, the, the business, you know, the stock or whatever, tax free to the extent of that basis. You know, or if it's a partnership, you know. So that partnership interest tax free to the extent of the basis. In fact, you can you can have a 754 election in place and get an inside basis step up, uh, you know, right away, and the, and the trust could benefit from that. Um, and you can do installment sale like on something like that, like for stock or whatever. You could also think if you have land or or, or other property that's not depreciable or amortizable, because if you depreciable amortizable stuff, stuff you you generally cannot. Sell an installment sale. So, what are some of the pitfalls? If the trust is a related person, then a resale within two years will accelerate the original seller's deferred gain, which I'm going to get into in a moment. Um, also, an installment sale locks in that gain. It becomes income in respect of an decedent, IRD, and and the IRD does not get a basis step up. Um, so. If you're locking in this gain, I mean, you can insure against death but and get life insurance, but um, either way, the tax is going to get paid. If the original seller later transfers the installment note, then the original seller would would um, recognize, would, would have a celebration of gain. So even if, even if they make a gift, they're going to have to recognize the gain. Or if they pledge the note, they're going to have to recognize the gain. Also, if the installment sale exceeds $5 million, then you figure out what the deferred tax liability is and you have to pay interest on that every year. Um, I already mentioned about partnership interest that, um, that the hot assets, those are not eligible for installment treatment either. They're ordinary income and not subject to installment sale treatment, um, as well as the idea about um, amortizable prop, uh, prop assets and you sell them to a related party, that can trigger ordinary income tax. And also the limitations for dealers. And and um, I am going to beat that up a little bit. Uh, you'll see you'll see some of the beef up in my uh, in my next quarters. Uh, there was some good papers at Heckerling this year uh, that uh, Paul Lee and Kathy Brewer and Cass Brewer did 
that go into a lot of details on on the on the dealers and other types of things like that. Um, I mentioned depreciation recapture doesn't get installment treatment. It, that doesn't take the rest of them prevent the rest of the gains from getting installment treatment, but but the depreciation recapture itself does get does does get deemed right away. And then ordinary income tax under the code section 51, that's the partnership interest uh, deal I mentioned before. We sell a partnership interest. Part of the gain on sale might be recharacterized as ordinary income. <clears throat> it's still gain on sale, but it's ordinary income. And so for trust accounting purposes, that would be ordinary income, but it's, it's a principal item. Still in DNI. All right. So... You can't sell um, publicly traded stock on an installment basis. Now, if you put publicly traded stock in a partnership and the person who put that stock in the partnership does not control the partnership, can't you know they, they, they can't control when the partnership sells that sells those underlying assets. Um, then you might then they then you may be able to get an installment sale on the sale of that partnership interest. So just take a look. There's a there's potential there's particular authority that discusses um, when you can or when you can't do that. Um, if an installment obligation is satisfied at other than its face value um, or otherwise disposed of, the deferred gain gets accelerated. Um, if you transfer it pursuant to a divorce, it does not get accelerated. And there's various business formations and liquidations that may, that may accept an acceleration as well, like forming a partnership or forming a corporation that, that will not that will not accelerate the installment gain. Uh, I already mentioned about installment notes being included in the holder's estate and having IRD. Uh, if you specifically bequeath the note to the obligor, that does accelerate the income to the estate. And there's no income distribution deduction for the bequest of the obligor. Um, now, on the other hand, it does generate DNI, and if you have other distributions that go to other people, you might be able to carry it out. Uh, transfers to and from non grant or trust accelerated. Um, so, yeah, again, I have a little bit more of a write up on it. All right, today's second secret word is payout. Please select the correct word below. Um, so while while we're doing the polling question, um, we had some some questions or comments. Uh, if the transfer of the note is by a trust within two years, if you if you transfer the note to a trust, um, and then that trust. Sells, I'm sorry, if you if you have the installment note and the trust then sells the assets within two years, that will accelerate the note. Um, if you transfer the note to a non-grantor trust, that will accelerate the gain no matter when you do that transfer to or from the non-grantor trust. Another question was, if the grantor trust holds S stock and the settler dies, how long before you have to make a QSST or ESBT election? And um, and it, is it two years from settler's death? And the answer is generally yes. Um, if you have a qualified revocable trust, you can get a tax as a, make an election tax as a state, be that longer. But I don't want to hold it as long as I can a lot of times. A lot of times I want to distribute into the downstream QSSTs so we can get a tax at the beneficiary's rate instead of the grantor's rate. I'm sorry, the set of trust because the trust rates are at the highest level. All right, polling question is done. I'm going to go ahead and move on. <clears throat> so I mentioned if you sell asset, that will accelerate the note if that's done within two years. Um, so another option would be sell to a trust that is not a related party. And, and then you don't have a waiting period. Um, if they um, basically, uh, if they sold the business 
right away, um, that's fine. There's not going to be any any gain to the seller. I'm, I'm sorry. There's not going to be any gain to the original owner. So, so do the the, the, the um, so for a sale trust. The unrelated parties will will buy the business interest from you. They give you an installment note, and then they go go and turn around and sell it. Um, and and then they got the sale proceeds and they'll invest them, and and then they'll pay them. They pay the sale proceeds back according to whatever the terms of the installment note are. And the problem is that there's tremendous risk because the installment note is basically going to have you know interest at a fixed rate. Maybe it's AFR, maybe it's higher, uh, and and then. It's up to whoever is running the trust to decide how to invest the proceeds from the sale. Um, and they're investing them however they want, and all you're getting is a fixed return. <clears throat> so you're taking all this risk. Just think about you know, any kind of business risk. You can't control the business, so there's no how many discounts for lack of control and lack of marketability for a very good reason, because you're taking big risks. And from the seller's viewpoint, um, I'm sorry, from the from the uh, you know the promoter's viewpoint, you know they're the trustee. They're also a beneficiary of the trust. <clears throat> so, so from their viewpoint, if they can make more money than they pay you, then they're going to come out uh, very very much ahead. They didn't have to put any money into this of their own. They get to take your money and invest it. And if they can invest for high returns, then they can walk away with a nice little fortune here. Um, so, what is their upside and downside? Well, if, if they if they get an upside, they they get to keep it. If the trust goes under, well, it's a trust, and there's no personal liability because it was the trust was the buyer. So, if the buyer runs out of money, then too bad for the uh, too bad for the person who for the seller. It's it's, it's your if the client's taking the risk that that money isn't going to be there. So so the deferred sales trust, they are incentivized to take risks to get return excess of the notes payment. And I have heard of trust default. Um, I've, I've heard of at least three case, occasions in the past 10 years where somebody is kind of like, well, I lost my money. It's like, well, you shouldn't have given it to those third parties. It's kind of the bottom line, unfortunately. So some deferred sales trust from what are sensitive, and they try to make arrangements to re- to reduce that risk. So, so they they will um, invest it according to whatever you have agreed with them about. There may be ways to even let the seller control the investment. But then the IRS is kind of like, well, maybe they are a related party in, after all. Uh, and and the IRS has come up with a bunch of arguments to argue about this. So basically, the the more the the the, uh, the less economic risk you take because you have control, the more tax risk you take because it's going to be related party. And there's a 2021 chief counsel advice that goes into the different theories the IRS might be using to attack this. Um, another thing to consider. To, to consider, instead of selling the installment, instead of selling the stock yourself, you, uh, to, you know, to the third, you know, to the uh, deferred sales trust or whatever it might be, instead of selling, transferring the property um, and doing your installment sale directly, put that into a partnership, and then the partnership does the sale and it receives the installment sale stock. I'm sorry, the installment note. It, it, it gets the installment note. So then. Um, you're never really transferring or bequeathing or whatever the installment note. You're bequeathing a partnership that owns the note. So, so that can help out with avoiding some of these traps. Now, it is still IRD, and there won't be a basis step up when your part when the when the when the uh, decedent dies holding the partnership interest. There won't be a basis step up um, on the part of the partnership attributable to that note. Now let's talk about 
far as short book redemption is and compare them to installment sales. And then I'll get into that into that uh, other case uh, down the down the road um, toward the end. So when a partnership redeems a partner's interest in full, there's two different ways to tax it. First, there's Code Section 736A, and basically that is shifting partnership income to the selling partner. And then there's Code Section 736B, where payments are not deductible to the partnership and they're capital gain to the partner. So in A, you're kind of getting a deduction or the equivalent of a deduction at the, at the partnership level. In other words, the remaining partners get that deduction, and the selling partner gets ordinary income. Um, whereas in 736B, nobody gets a deduction at all, but there's capital gain to the seller. So 736A, there's two different ways to do it. One is called guaranteed payments, and guaranteed payments, um, the the recipient recognizes those as ordinary income, and the partnership can deduct them only if they are deductible business expenses. So you have to prove the deductible business expenses. Now, for a retiring partner, sometimes this ordinary income may be excludable from self-employment tax. You kind of got to run through the rules, uh, and you see there's a citation there. Now, if the payments are based on partnership income rather than being fixed, then they're a distributive share of the partnership income to the retiring partner. So rather than the partnership having to deduct that in those payments and prove a deduction, you're simply shifting income to the retiring partner. So, so those are that's a lot safer to the buyers because they don't have to worry about proving the deduction. That income is just moving over. Now, the redemption agreement can provide that as little or as much of the redemption proceeds are going to be under 736A or B, but there are some rules on it. So there's flexibility, but there's also parameters. So the first rule is the 736B payments cannot exceed the fair market value of the withdrawing partner share of partial property. So um, if they're getting more than the fair market value of the partial property, then that's going to be a 736A payment. And again, you want to make that fixed or a distributive share. Um, then also, 736B payments cannot be for unrealized receivables. So that would be your cash basis taxpayer who has accounts receivable. So in other words, like a law firm or, or a CPA firm, you send out a bill and, and, and you don't have to pay, pick up income on it until you actually collect the bill. Um, but as a cash basis taxpayer, that's what we call an unrealized receivable because you 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 you're owed the money, but you don't have to get pay tax on it yet because you haven't received it yet, so it's not realized yet. So um, so you have that, um, and so you that has to be a 736A payment. Now goodwill is that has to be a 736A a payment unless your partial agreement says otherwise. So goodwill. You can choose between 736 A and B, um, but um, and and you, as long as you're conscious about it. But but our practice is that we want to be crystal clear when we're when we're drafting um, a redemption document. We want to want want both parties to agree. This is a 736 A payment, or this is a 736 B payment, because we don't want to have the tax the, the parties arguing with each other over the, the character of those payments. And then if you if you do designate it, then of course you have, here's the benefit on goodwill, if you, does, you, you have to designate it if you're gonna make it be the, the capital gain thing. Um, now on slide 45, um, I've, I've got some references to some illustrations. So, the, the kind of the bottom line here, when you look at 736A payment, what you're doing is um, you are deducting the payment by the, the buyer deducts the payment and the seller takes it into income. So it's ordinary income, ordinary deduction. Um, think about it when you, like when you have a C corporation. So when a C corporation, you want to get money to the shareholder employee, you pay them a salary, and, and yes, a FICA and stuff like that, but the corporation getting the deduction is beneficial. It saves tax, 
and and the, and then um, and then you have the income of the shareholder, and it's ordinary income. Now compare that to doing a dividend from the corporation. So the corporation does not get a deduction, and and the shareholder has to pay dividend rate capital gain tax, basically. Um, so in the first example, you have income and deduction, so the income tax system is kind of breaking even. On the dividend example, the um, Uncle Sam is coming out ahead because there's no deduction at all, but you got to recognize gain. So if you kind of think about the two things, you're better off as a whole. If you, if you count the buyer and seller together, you're better off as a whole, one party getting a deduction and the other party getting income, then you are having no deduction and having lower tax income. And so the idea is that whoever receives the ordinary income, you ought to gross them up. You ought to pay them extra for the fact that they are – uh, that they are having to pay ordinary income tax instead of capital gain tax. So you pay them a little bit extra. But but the person who's paying is getting this deduction for all of this, and so it makes it a much easier to make the payment. And so the bottom line is that the 736A scenario is much more income tax efficient than the 736B one uh, in in most cases. And and I do have some numbers that I once ran through with those. 221A, um, Romanet 1, you know, D and E, et cetera. Um, all of those kind of run through numbers to graphically illustrate, and they, they illustrate the gross up idea too. Um, so, so we really do prefer to do that 736A. Um, and, um, you, you might think about changes in future tax rates when you're doing your negotiations. Um, I don't know that people, most people really don't necessarily negotiate hard for that, but if you want to, you can. And some people do. Now, the 736, a, 736 payments are a complete liquidation of interest, so you can't just sell a little on 736. So, um, so you do you do have to sell the entire thing to get the benefits of 736. <clears throat> now 736 um, does not terminate the partnership even if only one owner is left because uh, because you are still considering to be an ongoing partner while you're receiving your 736 payments. If there's an assumption of liabilities, um, then um, there's timing issues with that. And um, if the if you're repaying the seller's capital account, they already got tax on the money. Then obviously there's not going to be a capital gain on that because they they have basis in it because they already taxed on it. Um, and of course there's not going to be a deduction either. But that would you would want to do 736B treatment for that because there's no income to the to the seller. Um, so it's only fair to not artificially generate this income deduction scenario. Um, now, if you're doing the 754 election and you're like 730, what happens with 736 uh, payments is that each year stands alone. So when you have, have the 736B payments, um, the, the early payments go 100% against the seller's basis. You don't prorate it. Like an installment sale, you take your basis and you prorate it and you recover it pro rata along with your sales price. That's not how a, a 736 redemption works. 736 redemption, you recover your basis first and then you pick up the income. And and once you have once you're picking up the income and you, so you have the gain on the sale of your asset, um, then the 754 election comes into place, and and the and the and you're generating um, each year and a separate asset. Who, um, you know, I told you you have this fictitious asset when you have the 754 election in place. 
So each year you have a fictitious asset. So if you're having 10 payments and all those payments have gained, then you're going to have 10 sets of assets. So that does make it a lot more complicated when you're doing the 736B. Um, so that's another reason to go by 736A uh, with, the, with the income and deduction. The buyer gets the benefit right away instead of having to set up all these different assets. Um, if you're not going to do a complete redemption, you could have profit interest that shifts over time and, um, and achieve results that are similar to those in 736A without completely retiring. So I like, suppose you have an older partner who brought in all the business in the firm and younger partners take over after a number of years. So instead of expressly selling the older partner's interest, you, you simply, they have a larger profit interest in the early years when they're still being productive and smaller profit interest in later years. And maybe the profit interest will continue even after they have retired. And of course, if they've totally retired, you can do 736A. So generally, the shifting of interest in the future profits is not a taxable event. So you're not structuring it as a sale, you're simply shifting the profits every year. And if you think about the big law firm, big law firms every year will just change how much, what, what share of profits everybody gets from one year to the next, all depending on their compensation system, which, which depends on you know, prior productivity and expected future productivity. Um, so in big law firms every year, people are shifting their profits interest. There's never any income tax consequence to that. It's just when you earn the income, you get it. Uh, now, if you're in a corporation, um, then you would consider maybe doing deferred compensation. And, and so the corporation can deduct that compensation every year, and, and then the retiring shareholder can get that income every year. Um, there's a lot to think about when you do that, and I'm not going to get into all the details here. I just wanted to point out that um, it, with a corporation, you do need to go and prove that it was reasonable compensation. The sooner you do that, the better. Um, but it does lock you in. You, you have a lot more, um, a lot more of your hands tied for that. So I'm not thrilled about doing that for a corporation, but I'm, I'll do it. But I'd rather be in a partnership. <clears throat> uh, I already mentioned about in terms of basis being 736B and having profit on the sale being 736A. Let's go on to our last secret word. Um, today's third secret word is installment. Please select the correct word below, installment. Somebody asked, do you record goodwill for the purchase of the interest? So if you buy a partnership interest and, and the, um, the partnership interest um, is, is essentially you're, buying good, you're, you're indirectly buying goodwill, so like you're, you know, part of the purchase price is relate to the, the company's goodwill, then yes, you would recognize a goodwill asset and you would amortize that over 15 years. Okay, all right. Um, we're good to move on. So let's go through some of our, uh, wrap up some of these 736 ideas and go on to our final topic. Um, okay. I'm just going to keep on going until I get something new here because a lot of this I've already said. Um, you know, well, I'm not going to do that either. Okay. The other thing is when you're doing a 736 redemption, the question is how do you document it? So 
if you document it as a note, then you you may very well be getting into an installment sale. Instead of applying 736, it might just be an installment sale. So um, my materials go into some details about this as to what kind of note would be more likely to create, create installment sale and take you out of 736. The bottom line is when you're selling your partnership interest, it's best not to have a formal note. So instead, you just have the contractual right. I mean, a note is a contract. An installment sale agreement is a, a redemption agreement is a contractual right. They're both contractual rights. And if the buyers do not make the distributions according to schedule, then you may have a provision in the partnership agreement that allows the seller to come back in and take control. So if you think about what would be required, let's suppose you sell stock and then the buyer defaults. So what do you have to do? So first you foreclose on the note, then you get a hold of the stock, and then you, you know, then then you elect directors and then cause those directors to and or ask the directors to uh, to do things to, to pay you back. That's a very cumbersome process. If you, if instead you have um, this, the redemption agreement. The redemption agreement says, if this payment is not made, then the buyer can come in and, and make it get done. You have fewer steps to, to handle with that. And and I have used that to great benefit when I when I had a, a deal that was originally going to be a note and. It was going to cause really bad balance sheet issues for the seller. I mean, for the buyer. The buyer's going to have this big, this big note on their book, which is going to ruin their business because they were. It was going to make them uh, with a big liability. It was going to make them unable to to get credit, and they require credit for the business to run. And and so, uh, so the deal I made was okay. We're going to make it um, and uh, basically 736A payments that are distributed shares of profit. So you don't have to book it as a liability, um, but if you don't make the payments, we're going to come in and take over the company, and and then they 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 would decide to hold up payments in one of the later years, and so I basically said to their lawyer, you know, look, we got these rights, and um, you know, do you you know you should maybe consider talking to your client about it, uh, and. And they talked to the client, and within 48 hours, we had our money because they didn't want to lose control of their business. Okay. Um, so, okay, and I just kind of mentioned, mentioned those issues. Um, if you admit a partner and redeem a partner close in time to each, the IRS might argue that the sale between the retire partner and the new partner. So you want to be very careful how you document things and and make sure that the cash flow to the redeemed partner comes out of the earnings rather than coming out of the money that the new partner put in. Um, so we had <clears throat> um, a letter ruling where you redeem, where you said no. <clears throat> so I just came for your study. Um, and I mentioned about installment sales locking in the gain as IRD. On the other hand, if you have 736B payments, those are – you get a basis step up for those is, is I think, the best answer. I don't know that we have any one particular authority that says for sure that you do in, in a way you can point to in black and white, but I think it's a very, very solid argument. So I'm, I'm very comfortable with giving that – with claiming that basis step up. Um, and and so I would um, I would get, take that basis step up, and then the 736 B payments are going to be tax free. And you might even decide at that point to convert 736 A payments to 736 B payments, so that so that you can reduce the smaller reduce the tax burden on it. Okay, and here's my answer about the good world. The question somebody asked earlier. Okay, and the, and also the 736B redemption, you, you're not required to charge interest 
Number one, partnerships are not required to use interest. That's an exception in 7872. And you don't have to pay tax on the deferred gain on the sale because the redemption is not considered to be a deferred gain. It's only considered to have a gain that occurs at each payment. All right, now I got some other things. I'm going to move on to the, in the, in the, to the very last case. And this has to do with a CPA firm and they distributed client-based intangibles. They took clients with them. And they and the partnership agreement uh, attributed value to those. And w- when they attributed value to those, um, the, the party partners did not I – mean, this, this is book purposes, okay? So for book purposes, there's value attributed to them. So the departing partners really should have just paid for those clients they took with them. But they didn't do that. Uh, and and they just took the clients. And so it was a deemed distribution of property out of the partnership agreement. partnership agreement says we are going to value the book of clients. And so they took them with them, and and they did not. And so, the, so there was kind of a gain here because there was no basis in the client-based intangibles, the book of business. There was no basis in it. So it was kind of like they, they took the goodwill. Uh, the court said it wasn't goodwill. It was something else. But – it was the equivalent of taking goodwill, and and it had zero basis. So there was some book gain on this, uh, and and that book gain did not get allocated to the party partners. It got allocated to the remaining partners, and so the party partners came to have a big negative capital account because they took they took this this valuable asset, uh, and and it reduced their capital account to a negative number, and the. Um, the remaining partners took the position that this was ordinary income. That they were able to allocate ordinary income from the partnership and and tag it to the departing partners. So it was kind of like a 736A payment would be, um, but it was kind of involuntary here. <laughs> well, the people shouldn't take in the clients with them. What can we say? But but normally when you get redeemed, you're going to get redeemed first of all. If you, you you're you're not going to have if you don't get cash if you take property with you normally a redemption is only you're just going to carry out your basis and the partnership interest and you're not going to have gain. In this case, the equivalent of a redemption occurred with property and there was ordinary income on it. So a big departure instead of carryover basis and no income tax when you receive property, they had ordinary income. So. That was a that that was a, a, a big surprise here. So I just wanted to make sure that you're aware of this of this case. And when you have redemption, you really need to go to your partnership tax expert and make sure that this fact pattern is not going to cause there to be a generation of income when you did not expect there to be one, or if there is generation of income that you know what the character is going to be. So. That's an important case to know. Not many people have written up about it. They simply said what happened, but they didn't say what to do. Uh, and, and I do have potential ideas for what to do in my materials, but I'll leave that up to you to look at. So you can see here on slide 73 all my various materials. Um, and uh, and I encourage if you don't subscribe to my newsletter, go ahead and do it. Um, when you subscribe, you get, you, you get a link to the that big PDF I was referring to, uh, and and uh, and you'll and, and every quarter you get the most recent version all for free. So there's my other resources, uh, and thank you very much for participating in the webinar. Please complete and submit the survey that will display at the conclusion of the webinar. Uh, I look forward to future contact with you, and and if there's any questions I didn't answer, um, please just go ahead. If you really want the answer to answer, to more with me, then just go ahead and email me, and and I'll get back with you uh, when, whenever I can. So thanks again very much. Uh, talk to you next quarter or hopefully before.